starting streaming now and I'm connected with Christine Dorn in Australia and we want to talk about what she is doing and we try to find a title, a short title <laughs> for what you are doing and it doesn't seem to be so easy, easy. and so I thought we, we use this a conversation to find a name <laughs> for what you are doing. <laughs> by talking about it. I love it. So, yeah. Uh, when you listen to it or watch it, uh, live watches or later watches, I'm Heidi Hörner from the wisdomfactory.net and I connect people or connect with people all over the world who have interesting things to share for you to get inspired and maybe try something else or collaborate in some whatever way you would like to and so today it is actually christmas day today and we are connected to australia so christine uh, do you want to to begin and this uh, explain a little bit your situation what you are doing and maybe at the end we come up with a short <laughs> title for that well, I, I think it would be really interesting. I, I love the idea that we would search for the title in doing the interview. And of course, one of the things that is, I think, quite similar for me to many people who've really gone for the whole integral community thing is that I don't live in a place where it's actually full of integralists, like there are very few of us around here. So I live in far northeastern Australia. And just to give you a sense of how far away we are from other things, we're 2,000 kilometers north of the state capital. And I live in a farming community that is, oh, it has the most beautiful natural landscape and the richest soil. But the soil to grow an integral community is pretty, poor and the plantings are pretty sparse <laughs> so one of the ways that I've um, satisfied my sort of search for community has been to go elsewhere and of course with the internet I've been able to be on online part of online communities whether that's doing a course or a group of people that I uh, relate to on a deeper level, but I've never found a way of actually creating a group here. And all of a sudden, whether it, and I suspect it's because my own development has taken me far enough to be able to do this at last. <laughs> I've been looking for this for a long time. I'm finding the people who are actually attracted to an integral approach to not just having a group, because we aren't just talking about creating community, but a group that wants to do something. So we're running a, what, what I call Startup and Innovation Tablelands. It's a community group that's all about um, startups and innovation. So it's about entrepreneurialism. Now, entrepreneurialism amongst Tablelanders, I live on the Atherton Tableland, um, is about as rare as uh, integralists. <laughs> so it, it sounds like a crazy place to be looking to do two things at once. That is to say, running this community group, but also having a second stream that's about the process, who we are, how we communicate, what, how, we, how well we can integrate practices into our running of this group that has a very worldly purpose. And the worldly purpose is to help people create new businesses or to improve the business that they have. And hopefully in the most sustainable way possible. And in fact, of course, the people who are attracted to this work are all into, surprise, surprise, sustainability. They're into integrating their lives and they want to see a more, um, sustainable and resilient community that comes out of this. But it is interesting that I've looked elsewhere and I've looked across the world. I mean, where did we meet, Heidi? We met first at either the Integralis Forum in 
Berlin, in Germany. Yeah. In 2014 in Hungary at the first IEC, at the first Internet, um, Integral Europe Conference. Yeah. So, yeah, what was I looking for? I was looking for my Integral tribe, <laughs> you know? And I, um, I was learning, of course, and becoming more adept at different practices and, and beginning to move a little bit in my own development in a more integral direction. So here I am a little further along in my journey and suddenly, or not so suddenly, but slowly over the last year, people have just been turning up. And we've gone and looked for them and uh, did things like uh, last year I ran that, or this year, the beginning of this year, beginning of 2018, I ran a Tableland's Purpose Summit for Business. And it was one of the most successful programs startup and innovation Tableland's had ever done. People loved it. And they loved the technique I taught, which was more to connect with your intuition and then use your intellect as well as your intuition to find your purpose. And I must give credit to Tim Kelly for this. It's really from him that I've learned most of this work. I've modified his techniques in order to present them here. But what came out of that was a mastermind group for business that really did things in a different way. So just as an example, one of the things that we tend to do in our mastermind group is uh, say a deep listening practice before the person who's going to have his business worked on presents his or her business to the group. And we find that if we do that real connected deep listening beforehand, people are much in the group are much less apt to throw out suggestions straight away or say, oh, all you need is a Facebook advisor or all you need is a social media strategy or all you need is a business plan or whatever it is, you know? The questions become very deep and very personal and very um, also directed towards what kind of resistance are you running into in your own interior to making your business work? And we're finding that just... Uh, a very, it's a refreshing way to talk about business. And it's also created this, I mean, the, all the practices that we do have created this feeling of trust. So we have a container. It's not a big group, 17 to 20 people maximum. And, but the trust has become more and more tangible. And our proficiency at deep listening, for example, at leaving suggestions behind and really helping to draw out of the person who's doing the speaking or whose business is being talked about, draw out of them what the, uh, what the solutions are for their own business. It's been fascinating. And now we've got enough interest that those people and other people who've come along are interested in seeing if we can run this really integral type process, such as the kind of thing that you hear about in deliberately developmental organizations, if you read Robert Keegan, for example. So it's the process, 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 what kind of practices, 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 and then we've got to get something done in the world. Because when Robert Keegan is writing about deliberately developmental organizations, he's talking about people who make money, who have businesses. It's not just a, uh, you know, a sort of a self-help group for losers, which is, to me, just delightful because there we've got leadership, we've got good examples, and now maybe I've gotten to the point where I can actually be part of a group like that or inspire it, but then let go of it enough that the leadership becomes collaborative and everybody is contributing to it. So that's a little bit of a high level overview of where we are, but isn't it interesting that I live in this place where when, when, the, when Europeans first colonized this part of the world, they, were, they chopped down the rainforest, of course, giant, beautiful, huge rainforest trees, just amazingly huge. And what they found underneath was 80 meters of topsoil. 80 meters. 
topsoil of fertile soil that you can grow anything in, 80 meters deep, untouched, beautiful, the most beautiful soil in the world, and lots of rainfall. So isn't it interesting that that incredibly fertile, this incredibly fertile place physically in terms of growing food or sustaining yourself has raised a group of people who were not very fertile soil for creating that kind of a group or for even thinking in that direction. But now it's seeping in. That's very really interesting. And now I'm asking myself how can we put this, for instance, in a title? Because that is so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Interval. That was a long title. <laughs> <I just did. laughs> but it, it, is, it is something about being in a place where, I mean, here's the metaphor. I live in this place where it is, just, I mean, it's spectacularly beautiful and it's spectacularly fertile. And yet it's been, you know, in my view, spectacularly difficult to create that kind of soil, human soil, you know, that, that people could grow in and people could develop in. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the, and the, you know, sort of the contradiction between the two has always been a bit of a piece of fascination to me. I mean, of course, I'm always interested in polarities and what's the difference between, you know, what's a context and what's a culture and what's a society and what what are the influences? And uh, you can hear that I was born in America, not Australia, but I've lived here for decades. And they, my experience has been pretty much the same all the way through those decades, and now it's changing. So who's changing, me or the Epperton Table Ant? Or both of us? I think we are all changing a little bit. And I do believe if somebody is putting down the seeds and gives mm. water, and wait, sooner or later something will come out. And I think what we integralists do is exactly that, that we try to spread the voice. This is also part of what I'm doing you know, with the Wisdom Factory, uh, making obvious or making shown uh, different ways of, of being or doing without pretending that we are masters in that. But it is sort of an experiment what we are doing and with a, with a clear intention to, to grow up and to, to create communities of people who are able to be more, ah, these words don't, don't fit like effective and things, they don't fit, but they are you can say sustainable, but also that is becoming to be a fashion oh, word, you know? A, so we run out to words. do things in a different way without throwing out the baby with the bathwater, integrating the wisdom and the, 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 the practices we, we had of all mm -hmm. the previous levels and finding new ways because we surely have to find new ways, you know, in the future. It will be so different. We, we have no idea how in 10 years or 15 years the uh, world will look like. So what we are doing, I think, and what you are doing probably with the group, which finally has uh, brought you some fruit, <laughs> yes, to open the minds of people to more perspective uh, than only the, the one we are used to. What I wanted to ask you, is it uh, different in Australia? Are people more open to new things than in other countries? What do you think? Or are they more easily to, to connect? How would it be if you had started the same thing where you came from in America? Just as hypothetical. Yes, as a hypothetical, I'm not really certain. But I think that we probably have more as human beings, we probably have more in common than we do as differences. So I think the same thing probably applies just about anywhere. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. I guess that this is probably not the least fertile soil. There would be places where you could be in serious trouble for doing what I'm doing, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, 
even though it's very innocent, but it's different. And it certainly defies the norms of behavior for the estrogen tablelands. But one of the things I'm curious about is that I finally found a way to, um, or this group seemed to more or less spontaneously come together. I know it isn't quite like that. I'm not even sure when I planted the seeds. I'm not even sure when I watered those seeds. I, I'm not sure when I sort of stepped across a threshold and was suddenly, not suddenly, was finally able to plant, have, not only have planted the seeds, watered the seeds, but then to see that the tree was growing. And I, I'm, I find the whole thing a little bit mysterious, quite frankly, because I can't really, I can't just take a, I can't take my finger and poke it at my calendar and say, that's the year that I got grown up enough to do this. <laughs> you know? I or that's think that's normal. <laughs> that's the, you know, I just, it's, it's quite mysterious. Why do things happen the way they do? I don't know. This is a good question. Why do we choose what we choose? No? Yeah. Why uh, do we do what we do? And in my life, I often thought I was sort of pushed to do things. But certainly, I have also agreed to be pushed, you know, or, or yeah. said no, and then I didn't go that way. So yeah. I think there's a deep, uh, what is it, biological, psychological? The question, what are we attracted to and why? And why different people are attracted to different people? What I would like to say is maybe the moment when you read, for instance, the books of Ken Wilber and were attracted to that and then yeah. went out to search people who, with whom you could speak, like I did, about mm -hmm. these things because they are not around here and not even often online uh, around. So... Uh, that might have been the moment when, when you came into the, into this mindset, and then was the seed for what you are doing now. Would you like to tell me a little bit about what what exactly it is? So you did a summit. What did you do in the summit? What did you, do you do in these uh, meetings? What what sort of businesses are there, and how do you collaborate to? To, to do that, what do you do? <laughs> right. Well, uh, you know, I, I have to, uh, I have to lay the blame on all this <laughs> to, at the feet of my teachers <laughs> because, I, you know, I, I feel like I've been, I feel like I've been quite a difficult case for the integral community in some ways. <laughs> that may sound a bit odd, but look, I'm 69. I'm not the spring chicken. You, a lot of people at this age have, well, not started many things in their lives, but they certainly don't start them at this age. I think I'm, uh, you know, I, I was certainly born into the baby boomer generation, and certainly I had the um, advantage or disadvantage of being born in a family where everything had to be perfect on the outside. You know, we had to have that patina of perfection as a family. And I think about Robert Keegan again when I say that, because when he talks about corporations, he says everybody's doing two jobs in most corporations. And the job they're not paid for is the job that really takes a lot of their energy, which is to keep up your profile. So you have to like on Facebook. You never see a, a, a picture of somebody having a fight with their kids. You all, they're always totally cute or totally something. Mm -hmm. Every breakfast is perfect. Every, you know, whatever TV show you watched was the right one to watch, whatever. The, um, I just feel as though that whole business of having a second job, which is managing your profile, which is making sure that you look good and you sound good and you are dressed right and you've got the right clothes on and you're imperturbable. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You're imperturbable. You don't get upset by people. You don't get triggered. You, you know, you're always uh, uh, performing. That that was, I learned that 
practically the minute, minute I popped out of the womb. And it's taken a damn long time to even make a dent in that, uh, in that behavior. And I just think that yeah, why, where do things come from? Uh, you know, if you're into the Enneagram, I'm a counterphobic six. Mm. Well, what are sixes on the Enneagram? What do they, what do they want? They want harmony in a group. Oh, well, here I am trying to create harmony in a group. But I'm a counterphobic six. Everything I'm afraid of, I run straight at it. You know, if you look at my astrological chart, it says that one of my big life lessons is to learn self-worth through relationship with others. Well, what am I doing? I'm learning self-worth through relationship with others. So it all somehow fits together. But boy, it's taken a long time for those puzzle pieces to fall into place. And I sort of think that those of us born in the baby boomer generation, we, are, we sort of started at a disadvantage. We were born into a different era of consciousness. Uh, most of us had parents who belonged to what Dr. Keith Witt calls the autistic generation cut off at the neck. Yeah. Um, and we, I mean, school was a completely industrial era arrangement and teams were the same and corporations were the same and families were basically the same. Everything was hierarchical. Everything was uh, pretending to be perfect. Everything was uh, worked out in a way that really suppressed a lot of the naturalness of what people can learn to own. Yeah. And then it was also a time in which the, let's say the paradigm shifted and so we were the first generation trying out something new but not really knowing what we were doing, not knowing where, where we were going. Only the old things, we didn't want them anymore, but there is so much uncertainty about what we really want, what we really are, what, 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 where to go. And then the self-first thing, I mean, with this upbringing, that was not a good, you know, <laughs> a good way to get much self-first. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it seems that the generations later have got too much self-worth and so comes the, <laughs> the narcissistic yeah. thing. And so uh, maybe the pendulum goes from one side to the other and the next generations now maybe uh, get it better together. But So what we were, especially women, I think in our generation, they were either, like you said, like a contraphobic six, just going through like cutting with a, a, a sword or holding back. I'm more the holding back type. For me coming out doing public things, that's in the last five, six years or so. And I'm not quite your age, but very near there. So it's not uh, that I'm a spring chicken either, you know. So we are in some way late and uh, hopefully the younger women um, get it a little earlier, <laughs> let's say. Uh, I experience this all the time, that I meet younger people, not all of them, but many younger people who really, I just have this strong sensation and feeling, and the more I delve into it, the more I have that, that uh, confirmed for me, that they have been born into a completely different consciousness than we were born into, and... Uh, that they've really soaked that up, that more expanded consciousness, and they can really walk right into that consciousness compared to the struggle that, say, somebody like myself has had to go through to even get there. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and then start to take uh, people who are already fully adult uh, and try to do a process with them that creates that expansiveness it's not so easy. And I, once again, I have to say that it's my teachers and the, and my fellow students who've allowed me to take these evolutionary steps in my own development. With because teachers, you mean, can myself, do you pardon have, me? teachers, you mean, can verbal, uh, the books, or do you have other teachers? You? Y yes, I, I, I'm not very good at just, at, at 
adherence to one guru. I'm very eclectic. I always have been and uh, about everything I do. So I've had many teachers, but yes, I could give you a long list of people that I particularly admire. And since we're in an integral, uh, we're on an integral stage, you know, I've done a lot of work lately with Terry O'Fallon and Kim Barton, who mm -hmm. I find just, I mean, they're just such expanded human beings. They're such beautiful people. And it isn't even just what I've learned from them but being in the presence of those people. And that's one of the reasons I find the Integral European Conference so important, to be surrounded with 600 people who are looking for the same things you are. It's just a, just a feast. It's just, it's just, it's my idea of glamorous and there's nothing really glamorous about it in the normal sense, but yeah. that's my idea of glamour. Yeah, it's like, um... How can I say, like swimming in your waters where you feel yes. uh, the right temperature. <laughs> exactly, it's like the fish that belongs there. And yet, you know, I approach this whole thing and of, of trying to help establish s some more of the integral principles on the Atherton Tablelands with a feeling of uh, quite high anxiety about my own performance quite strong ambivalence about whether I'm actually ready for this. And uh, it, it is an interesting thing where I'm, I, I've had great teachers, I've had great support, I have wonderful friends all over the world, but I have observed <laughs> this, uh, this uh, pattern of first of all, reaching out to the whole world to find the right people to be with. And then last year I did a generating transformative change program with just Australians and New Zealanders. So that brought me into a circle of 15, a cohort of 15 people who are really integrally informed and have really worked on not just our own individual evolution, but the evolution of the group. So we've used Otto Sharma and we've used uh, all of of uh, Terry O'Fallon's work, we go back to Ken Wilbur. So it's, it's a very, it's a very, uh, it's a very interesting uh, thing to see that the development of the group is actually something that has to be focused on, not just your own individual development. I've always been an, a development freak. I mean, I had an awakening experience at 12, 13, and uh, I've been a self-development addict ever since. However, you know, that whole thing of being able to not just work on your own development, and I've never been interested in being a coach or a therapist or anything like that, but this business of developing groups so that the group can evolve as well as the individuals, that just, it, that just rings all my bells. But I'm scared to death of it. <laughs> That's why I've waited this long, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, yeah. Maybe we yeah. need first to to come to a certain level of our own development before we take on the what we feel as purpose of life. I, I, I think I could relate to that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think your purpose keeps evolving. Yeah. So, you know, as you uh, move into another stage of development, your purpose mm -hmm. can expand. What so I... That's the way. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Please. Okay, I, I speak. <laughs> Sometimes yes. there's a lag, so... Yes, little, there is. Yeah, Sorry. Um, the group thing, I think it's really the next stage of, of, let's say, our development in the world, because we humans are uh, not alone. Also, I have, for instance, the, the false belief of I'm alone, and I'm very much alone now. Uh, even no, now Mark is not here with whom I was very together. But now I'm sort of alone and I feel coming back this, um, this tendency of, of being alone. That's as a, you know, a personality trait thing. Um, but when we are a bunch of people who are all doing their own things parallel without connection, what sense does it make? 
I mean, we, we are too many people on this planet now that everybody can do their own thing and fight against the others who do slightly a different thing. So for me, the next step is really to become able to be in a community, which I'm not so sure that I am, uh, and learn that and then create these communities. So uh, I'm really wondering how, how you do that. <laughs> Look. When I find out, I'll tell you. <laughs> it's just an experiment. I mean, how do I know? How do I know how to how to make this work? In fact, I'm sure I don't know how to make this work. You know, if you say make it work, it it has to evolve on its own, and it has to, you know, the group has to sort of pull it out of itself. Of course. There will be some leadership from me, but I'm seeing already that there's leadership from others. So we're really doing some collaborative leadership, which I, you know, once again, did I take a course to figure that out or did I figure it out for myself? I did take a course. It's called the Collaborative Operating System. Now it's a little bit like Holacracy or any of those other um, collaboration systems, but what that did for me was really show me some techniques and um, be very concrete about developing ways for a group to become more integrated and to have, share collaborative leadership. Without those courses, I would be lost right now, but I still often feel lost. So how do we, how, how, how are we doing this is what you're, what you're asking me. I've been, I've been an activist my whole life, basically. And uh, I can see that all of that activism, which started out more as environmental activism and has slowly evolved in my life, has been preparing me for what I'm doing now. But of course, most of what I've been doing has been practicing standard group formation. And so how were we actually going to do an environmental movement where we didn't because what do you see in the environment? You see, I mean, people talk about, you know, competition, but what you see is more collaboration than competition in the environment. And uh, how are we going to translate that if we're fighting for the environment, but we're using all these old techniques to develop groups that fight for the environment, where is that going to end up? I mean, you're going nowhere because the, the very process that you're using, the very practices you're using, the very communication techniques you're using are anti-collaboration. Well, that takes a lot of working through. So I think that I've been building myself up for a long time, but I've also been building up, well, sort of a spider web of, uh, you know, a, a, a rhizome net of uh, people who want to grow out of more fertile soil and really flourish in a way that you just can't flourish in industrial age groups you know in hier strictly hierarchical groups in groups that really don't pay attention to the interior of the uh, interiors of the other people or, or the one's own interior so but where that transition moment came that I could actually see how that could possibly work or I sort of stumbled into it I mean, there was a lot of intention, but I never could quite make the intention just make the thing happen. It had to sort of evolve on its own, even though the intention was pushing it or pulling it or something. Yeah. Yeah. It sort of had to evolve on its own. And I, I do believe that I've been sort of chipping away at this for a very, very long time, simply asking people at a normal meeting to do a moment of silence before they start, and then to go around the group and have everybody do a check-in such that what they get rid of in that, th a very short check-in, 30 seconds, is whatever would present, prevent them from becoming truly present at the meeting. And I look, it doesn't really matter if, you know, if it was your cat got run over this morning or you, uh, you the, the milk was sour or <laughs> something really banal and stupid like that. Um, but 
just doing those little rituals that most people can go along with, or at least I think that what happens is I'm a bit of an eccentric. And if I'm the head of a group, I suggest things and they sort of humor me. <laughs> well, let them humor me. <laughs> but then it becomes a practice and a habit. And sooner or later, people begin to think, oh, actually, I am more present when I said, you know what? I don't want to be at this meeting. I don't want to be here. I don't want to be part of it. I'm, you know, I'm tired. I've had a terrible day. I wish I could just go home and crawl into the covers and stay like that. Didn't take 30 seconds to say. And all of a sudden, you're a real human being. You're not the person who's pretending, I got this thing nailed. I'm fine. I look good. I smell good. I talk good. I, you know, all those things, <laughs> which are... You know, it's just often not the case. Or part of us is uh, in a good place and part of us isn't. So, you know, just little things like that. And it seems like such a little thing. But I've run into a bit of resistance for people doing such a simple thing. But all of a sudden, then, I began to see that I could offer a way of uh, communicating with your, whatever you call your intuition, and that, that that communication, which is done in silence, you know, you have to sink into yourself to get in a meditative state, and then, then something comes, you hear something, see something, smell something, feel something. It might be a body sensation, might be purely kinesthetic, might be purely visual with your eyes closed, whatever it is. It's, that's not that big a step. And I was surprised at how many people really, really appreciated working on their purpose it, because this original uh, uh, event was called the Tableland's Purpose Summit, Su Purpose Summit for Business. And just working on your purpose by digging into your unconscious isn't that hard. Everybody can do it. Well, we had a few people who made good jokes about it. You know, one said, "Ah, oh, I married my intuition. I don't need to develop my intuition. Well, he clearly didn't come back. And in fact, I know his wife. She is a beautifully intuitive person and takes care of that side for both of them. How clever of him. What good insight that was. And everybody had a good laugh about it. But we also had, a, we had an Aboriginal gentleman in that group who uh, finally said, he put his hand up a little tentatively and he said, you know, I think when we have this connection to our land that, that indigenous people in Australia seriously have, that's what you're talking about. When you talk about intuition, you're talking about connection to the place, to my land. And we call that Goopy, G-U-P-I. So the whole group adopted Goopy as, it, as the name of its intuition. Now, you could say fairies in the garden, or you could call it trust and sources, or you could call it God, or you could call it whatever you wanted to call it. But it was so cool to have somebody who really understood intuition give us a word. So sometimes things just happen that way. And then off we went, and I taught the technique. And then we split up into groups, and I assigned facilitators and gave them basic, very basic instructions mostly normalize everything doesn't matter what people say it's fine <laughs> you know yet i've got no purpose that's fine that's your intuition telling you you haven't found your purpose yet or you're not ready to hear it or whatever so you know we had a three four hour event that really opened people up that made them feel like they had a practice that was about looking inside not looking outside and of course all of us understand that we've got an intellect. When we grow up way too heady, and people like me who are intellectually oriented, my God, what a heady human being I am, and how hard has it been to find my heart? It's just been so difficult, but worthwhile. Yeah. And I think that that was the feeling that came out of that, 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 uh, that very generative meeting where people just lit up. Wonderful. Does that give you an idea of what kind of practices we do? Because really getting connected with yourself and then getting connected with the group is, uh, is where we're headed. So what I'm getting out so far out of our conversation is 
that we spend too much time into our persona, showing up as yes. persona normally. And what inspired me now a lot when you said the check-in should be to not to show the persona and that's everything. Oh, I did this and I did this and I did this. That may be important, but really say what is in the moment. Even say, I don't want to be here. And maybe I go, yeah. maybe I'm here. And be so, how do you say, really honest about what is in you instead of giving a, a list of what you have done that day. And that this can open up the space for everybody. And then the other thing which I think is very, very important is what you are doing is truly not a green group because I'm confronted sometimes with green people who like, try to make a group and with the missing leadership, it doesn't go anywhere. You know, there needs to be somebody who, who is not authoritarian because not every leader is authoritarian, but who has the things, leads them together and, and gives the, maybe not even gives the direction, but maintains the direction, is the guardian of, of what is, is going on and also the inspirator. Because I have the experience in green groups, that level of collaboration hardly, hardly can, um, can come into being because it's dispersive and, you know, how can I say? Everybody is still fighting, as you said, for, for, for the better world instead of collaborating. So co collaboration in a green mindset or even before, well, before it's hierarchical, but in a mm. green mindset, collaboration for me seems to be almost impossible. I mean, that doesn't mean that many people can be in the, in the green level, but there needs in my opinion, somebody who weaves the things together and you seem to be in that role. I think you may have said something very important to me, which is that I'm sort of the, um, I'm sort of like the elder who holds the tradition, only I'm the elder who holds the new tradition, <laughs> if, you, if you will. So, because I've had the most experience and of course I've really dedicated a lot of my life to this, to inspecting my own interior but also to tr trying to learn my life lesson which is self-worth through relationship with others so how do I do that well you know I, I really appreciate what you said because I stop and think that every single time still when we do a check-in I always say I'll model that and then I start out and I don't say, I'm fine, because then everyone would say, I'm fine. <laughs> they would go right back to protecting their persona, right? So I'm always sure to say something that indicates that I'm vulnerable. I'm sad and lonely. I'm distraught. I'm tired. I'm something. I'm anything that is going to stop me from being present. And then I hope that that goes around the group. And sometimes it has to be, and, and here that you're right, that I have the role of the new tradition holder, so to speak. Sometimes I have to sort of tease out a real answer to that question because some people just want to say, I'm fine. And it uh, doesn't, help us. It doesn't yeah. help us to pretend. It does not help to pretend. Now, there might be times when you have to pretend. You know, you've got a sick friend. Well, you're not going to confront them with everything you know about their resistance to being well when they're sick. No, thank you. But if you've got a vol voluntary group of people who've come together for a meeting, there's a certain amount of shaping, holding that container, but shaping that container that you can do. And if you don't do it and you're capable of it, you've committed a crime, <laughs> you know, a crime against humanity. <laughs> I How mean, that's do you, yeah. okay. How do you handle when 
what people often do is when they hear somebody maybe in the check-in that something is afflicting them and they immediately come and want to fix it. <laughs> Look, uh, we make it very clear what the rules are. No crosstalk, no discussion, no questions. This is not about creating a therapy group. This is about being honest so that all of us can trust each other. That's all. And so that we can be present with each other. And listen attentively. Then you go into, you know, whatever, whatever has to be done to keep the meeting going and then say this deep listening exercise. And after that, what we find is that we're more, way more attentive to the people who are presenting their business. Or we do a trust, ex a, a complete trust exercise. You know, one of those ones where you get up and close your eyes and somebody else steers you around the room. Or you fall backwards, we haven't done that one. But you know, there are so many exercises to do and we have to get up out of our chairs and do those exercises at times or turn to each other and do some eye gazing or do some kind of deeper questioning. We always sit in a circle. We try never to sit with a table up in front of us at those particular groups. And it really, all those little uh, manipulations, if you will, of the stage, the scenery, the setting, they all help to create that container. And uh, boy, I tell you, I don't know how to do this, but it certainly is fascinating having a go. <laughs> and, and of course, Australians will. This is one wonderful thing about Australia. It's a real Australian phrase. Oh, well, I had a go, meaning I tried. And Australians will always give you credit for trying, which is really lovely. Mm. So you have the advantage that you have your group life in person and you meet yes. in a circle which yes. I don't have here. So I have only the online groups. Yeah. And yeah, there can be that people come and disrupt, let's say the field in which you are weaving. So you probably don't have experience, but I'm really curious how to, to, to do that. I lately uh, stepped up and said, um, sort of um, experience, uh, but I noticed that we had created a certain uh, field and then this, the person came in and was completely somewhere else and didn't want to come into our space and disrupted the space. We were going down, let's say, the Sharma uh, stage All right. levels, you know, and he immediately put it back into the first level, you know. So right. also we talked about it then in a sort of meta conversation it didn't really go back anymore so it is oh. um, easy to be disturbed these fields do you have experience with that in person yes and each time something like that comes up i feel quite challenged to hold that space inside myself and for the group so i I'm not sure who gets to the point and how they get to the point of being absolutely comfortable to be taking on that role uh, and successfully bringing the group field back together again. But I certainly think that, that uh, it's striking how often that has to happen because it's just like a kid learning how to walk. You, falls over, gets up, falls over, gets up, falls over, gets up. And I think that that's what we have to do. We have to just fall over and get back up again. Now, the, the example that you're talking about was online or in person? Oh, online. Online. And you could never recover the group field, even when you tried to talk about it in a meta conversation. Yeah. I'm sure that's going to happen. I think it's inevitable. Yeah, and I think when I got more confident with the integral map, I was happy that I could realize in integral you can take out over leadership again. It's not um, so taboo, tabooized, and you can also have roles again, which in green circles are a big taboo. 
So yes. I feel much more confident in, in doing that now, in creating rules when it is my group. In that case, what I told you was participating me in another person's uh, ah. group. But in my group, we ruled it like that. We ruled it. We resolved it like that, that we extrapolated the rules which are mm -hmm. already there normally and write it down and and then we ask in future the people who are participating in the live conversations to commit to these rules and then have some signs like a bell or something to and this in green you can never do that you know when you are in the green level oh, of I development because everybody is has can can hijack the whole <laughs> conversation with their stuff you know so i'm really grateful to have learned that and to not be shy anymore and to say now what i need to say and when i have the responsibility and even if i feel that maybe in groups of others that something is going on which is not good and it's not nominated that i i begin to say that and what I need to learn is to find the right language for that, you know, that it's not blaming and not, um, how do you say, diminishing the people, but being clear in what has happened and how, how to meet this, you know, that's really a learning curve, in my opinion. Huge. Absolutely huge. For me, that has been huge. I'm glad you find it the same way because sometimes I feel like I just don't learn very fast. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult thing to learn. Absolutely. Mm. And this is so necessary for creating groups. I mean groups. I don't mean necessarily close groups, but create a communication between people. And this mm -hmm. for me is in the ground, the fundament of peace in the world. Because if we can't do it in small groups, how can you pretend that <laughs> nations can do it? Nations are people. The people who yeah. are doing the negotiations, they represent nations, but they are people. And their decisions come... Uh, oh, now I hijack a little bit this topic. I just read uh, Hans Rosling. Factful, oh, yes. the book. It's yeah. How little we know about what is really going on in the world. So you know, and even our the people who decide for us, they don't know a lot about what is really the fact in the world. And this is quite frightening. And when I read the book, I met the commitment to myself to learn better before I open to wipe my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> a wise move and the fact is that there is too much information but we have access to too little of it so how to restrict that so that you actually do in a small group manage to um, hold the container and create a, a space or co-create a space such that the autopoesis or the the um, self-creation of rules and processes and whatnot can be done in the group and they can be looked at consciously this is not an easy task and especially for people who are as completely socialized into a completely different era as somebody like myself mm -hmm. yeah i can very much in the 60s, we all knew what we didn't want, but yeah. we couldn't figure out what we, we did. We had no idea. We hadn't heard of Ken Wilber. We had no idea what we wanted or what the alternative would be. And it's taken all this time for these really to build up and build up and build up. And it does seem to me that the small group is the place to start, not yeah. the nation state, not yeah. even the local council. Um, yeah. You know, local government is not the place to start. Small groups are the place to start. And you have to start with people who don't have huge resistance to it, who are at least welcoming of the idea that you have an unconscious, that everybody has an interior, that we could be more kind and more 
uh, compassionate with each other, just the way we communicate. Yeah. Okay, and just that is really difficult for me. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm used to being quite brash and quite uh, strong in my formulations. It goes along with counterphobia, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm not afraid of anything. I can say whatever I feel like. But in fact, I can't. And, uh, you know, that discipline of finding the right word at the right moment or the right silence at the right moment is huge. You know, I, I just have to make an observation, which is that in these groups that are more advanced, what I'm observing, and, and I observed the same thing at, uh, at uh, the Indo-European conference, at, at a lot of places where I turn up these days, silence, the amount of silence a group is willing to tolerate is a huge indicator of how far advanced they are. Yeah. And being able to have a rule in the group that anybody can call for silence because you've lost the hum at the bottom of the U for if you talk auto Sharma. Uh, you've lost that, that uh, connected group field that you get in the bottom of auto Sharma's U. Uh, how do you get it back? Well, it's almost impossible to talk it back. And we're so used to talking into everything. And boy, I'm a talker. I love to talk. You know, you, you put a microphone in front of my face, you can't shut me up. I'll trot, tread over your back to get to a TV camera. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I love to talk to a microphone. That's, a, that's an impulse that I absolutely have to keep under control in myself because it doesn't help. No. But feeding into when the moment to be silent is, that's something that really helps. And learn to recognize when it's the moment that you have to shut up. Because also so I have hard. this problem, <laughs> or I don't talk, or when I talk, then I'm not stopping. And sometimes Mark told me, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Stop doing that. <laughs> It's not about you, it's about us. <laughs> so no, how can we have this conversation now? now? <laughs> what was that? How, how we started out to find a title for our, for our conversation. So it's something like, um, learning new ways of being together or something, but it's also not so very. Yeah, it sounds sort of bland, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it does. But how refreshing is it to be with people who have built up a feeling of trust? How refreshing is it to be able to give and receive feedback without sort of shriveling up inside or without thinking, oh, do I dare say this? Or will they take offense? Or... Well, you, you have to figure out how to phrase it, but you don't have to figure out that you can do that, that you have permission to be yourself. It's just not. Yeah. Groups, <laughs> it, it, yeah. groups or meetings where you can be yourself. Um, and, but it's not only because in, when it, you, you People can say, oh, that's myself, and then they talk for two hours. So that's not the right title either. I think we have to think about it and leave this conversation <laughs> without title. <laughs> well, we can think about a title uh, because it's the mystery, the experiment that, that opens up the mystery. I don't know. I don't know what else to say. The mystery <laughs> of call co-creation yeah call it that okay i write it down small group. <laughs> yeah, write that down <laughs> there we've co-created a, a temporary title yes okay. may turn into the permanent title okay and with that i would like to stop the broadcast and i invite you people if you are ready to co-create in such a group either yes. you are in Australia and not too many thousand miles away from <laughs> connect with her 
uh, Christine, your website. Can you say that? You know, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to necessarily give you my own website, but the website where you can connect with this group yeah. is Startup. Uh, it's it, the group's name is Startup and Innovation Tablelands. The the URL for the website is www.startuptablelands, all one word, I'll spell it, dot org. So S T A R T U P T A B L E L A N D S dot org, O R G. Mm -hmm. okay. And that's where you can learn about the group that we've done. You can, you can mm -hmm. find a contact for me and you can work on those things because I haven't worried so much about creating my own website as making sure that we have a really good communication means for this group or for these groups. Wonderful. And who wants mm -hmm. to co-create with me uh, online conversation groups of this type? Not necessarily about startups, but about how to manage no. our lives. Uh, please connect with me on thewisdomfactory.net. Okay, and if you 